Welcome everyone to another episode of the Can Mammies Kill a Jedi podcast. I'm your co-host, Darth Selim. And I'm your main host, the Artificial Dragon. And welcome to episode 66 of the podcast, everybody. Without further ado, I will go ahead and get the Patreon stuff out of the way. Um, as per usual, our Discord is open to everybody if anybody is interested in joining our humble little community that we have in the making. It's always nice seeing new people coming in every week or so. But, uh... Yeah, um, it's a new month, and uh, there will be another Patreon art piece coming in near the end of the month, hopefully sooner. But for now, we have the Night Sister. We are trying out a new artist, and I believe they have done an amazing job with this first art piece. Mm hmm. But yeah, um, if anybody loves our content, you could go to the Patreon at patreon.com slash canmail. Once again, that is patreon.com slash canmail. Uh, any amount you could tr contribute is always greatly appreciated. The lowest being $2 and the highest being $10. And when you contribute to the consular tier, you get the Patreon art piece and also exclusive voting rights for a future episode topic that you want us, want me and Hannah to cover. Yeah. We'll be getting a new uh, voting poll in the next couple of episodes for this month. Looking forward to what you guys suggest in the Discord and what to ultimately vote on. I'm looking forward to it. I really am. Mm -hmm. And as per usual, shout out to our highest tier patrons. Uh, shout out to Y Wolves, Cameron Lee, Dr. Emboss, Gobez, Tristan H., and our newest member, Milo. Thank you so much for supporting our con <coughs> excuse me. Supporting our content for the past two years. It feels like a it honestly feels like a lifetime since we made this podcast, Hannah. Been probably what, almost two and a half years now? Two and a half years. We uh started uh, back in like September two, three years ago. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's, it's been it's been almost three years now. I think September will be three years. Yeah, it's going to be three years in September. And as per usual, check out Hannah's blog. Yes, please. I would like more questions because <laughs> I want to keep this active. Uh, don't worry. I'll throw you a couple more questions uh, when I give a chance. And probably after we're done recording this episode of a podcast. But yes, mm -hmm. uh, go check out Hannah's stuff. Provide a question for her uh, Swator characters. It's always nice for her to track, um, practice her writing skills more often. Yep. But, It'd be appreciated. Yeah. Um, but with that aside, Hannah, I think you know what today's episode topic is going to be about. We're talking about the spies of the galaxy. <laughs> yes, uh, we specifically will be talking about the Boffins. And uh, we already did another kind of spyish race with the Chiss like over a year ago. But we'll be exploring the, the quote-unquote good guy spies of Star Wars. I say quote-unquote... <laughs> But yeah, um, they're we, not really good guys. No, they uh, <laughs> they are uh, anything but good. But at least they're on the good side, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, in other words, we will be exploring our very first furry species episode of a podcast. <laughs> so yeah, um, got some representation. I'm not sure if we have any furry fans out there, but yes, uh, the Boffins are indeed a furry race, as you could probably see from most of the pictures. Uh, funny enough, I think when they were first introduced in the Fraun trilogy, they were described as hairy humanoids, until later they looked more like horse people than anything else. I don't see horses, I just see a weird dog-looking creature. A little bit of a dog, but I believe uh, there are some sources that call them uh, ungulate, which is like the same family as horses, uh, elephants, you know, the hoofed creatures. But yes, we will be exploring the boffins, um, the mammalian anthropoid race native to the world of Bafui. 
Um, Bafaui. Bafaui. Uh, I've heard it pronounced a, a menagerie of ways, but I, I'm not going to focus too much on the pronunciations because it is sci-fi. A lot of made-up words here and there, so I'm not going to worry too much about it. Um, but yeah, uh, the Boffins were mentioned in Return of a Jedi. That famous quote with many Boffins died to bring us this information. Mm-hmm. But, but let me actually give you a nice little quote that does explain the Boffins in a nutshell. <clears throat> I pity them, Counselor. I really do. For all the strength and mental agility they claim their political techniques provide to their species, I see them as essentially unhappy people. Their whole outlook on life breeds mistrust, and without trust, there can be no genuine peace. <laughs> But yeah, uh, if that quote doesn't explain the, doesn't entirely explain the boffins in a nutshell, basically, they are a very scrupulous, very mistrusting, and very deceitful race. Like I mentioned before, I joked that they're basically the spies from TF2 in Star Wars, and it isn't entirely accurate. I mean... They don't exactly have a disguise kit or anything like that, or literally stab you in the back. Ha ha! Backstab! But they are a very scrupulous and very deceptive race who are always looking at everybody with mistrust and suspicion. I mean, a whole turning point, I think, in like the first couple of chapters of Spectre of the Past is about the Bothans being involved with a plot. Yeah. Yeah, good old Boffins, even though they are working for the good guys, they still have their own agenda that they're pursuing. Yep. But yeah, um, and the Boffins, uh, we'll get to their most famous part, but like I mentioned in the Chiss episode, which are arguably one of the most secretive races in the entirety of a Star Wars galaxy, I like to think the Boffins as basically the furry equivalent to the Chiss. They're not, I mean, we do have a good amount of lore on them and their everyday citizen life in comparison to the Chiss, but they, if you take away their appearances and their culture, it's pretty much night and day. They are a very secretive, very mistrustful race who see other members that aren't their race as basically lesser. Mm-hmm. But let me uh, shut up about that and get into a little bit of the outlines of the Boffins and their homeworld. Um, so, Bafaui is found within the mid-rim region of space, within the Boff system. And I believe, very much like Earth, it is the fourth planet orbiting their sun, which is also called Boff. Um, it has a uh, day and night cycle of 27 hours compared to 24 hours, um, an orbital period of 351 days, and it has a population of 2.5 billion 98% being Boffin and 2% being humans and other races. Uh, the world is orbited by three moons. And it also possesses a very temperate climate. And its axial plane is slightly wobbled, which caused numerous small ice ages to roam across the world in a majority of its history. Um, it was dominated mostly by mountains, forests, grassy savannas, and several polar ice caps. Um, wildlife on the world is described to be very dangerous, but are mainly separated by the numerous mountain ranges away from many major settlements. Um, some notable creatures native to the world are the Ak, which is basically their local bird of prey, nothing too special there. Um, they also have a uh, local fauna called the Boffin Sky Dragon, which is a rare and almost extinct species of reptilian avians. There's no picture of this, unfortunately, but I think it's pretty cool that they do have their own dragons on Bafui. Mm-hmm. Then, of course, they have uh, this 
weird flora-like creature called the, uh, let me see if I can pronounce this, the Halkra, also known as the Strangling Vine. So basically, it's a plant that could eat you. It looks like it can eat you. Yeah. Um, let's see, where was I? Okay. Um, there's the Rodrock, which is a uh, subterranean serpent, um, and is actually considered the the most hated pest on all of Bafui. Basically, they're like uh, little serpents that dig through the ground, and because of that, they destabilize a lot of structures on Bafui, so they're kind of like termites in terms of uh, comparison. Remind me of sandworms from Beetlejuice. Yeah, they kind of do, don't they? Um, mm -hmm. Let me see, there's also the... Uh, I think, yeah, these are uh, Swator creatures. Um, there's the Scarclaw, which is basically a uh, bipedal crocodile-like creature that kind of looks like a Rancor. Well, obviously, because that picture is from Swator itself. Yep. You find them on Rishi. Yeah. So, yeah, um, a, lot of, a lot of dangerous animals on these worlds, and... It's kind of a fair assumption to see Bafui as basically another space Australia. Mm -hmm. Well, let me see. Um, but yeah, Bafui is known as a major trade world, given it is the center of trade within its sector, and it is the hub of what I, the hub of four different trade routes, such as the Boffin Run, the Kaga Run the Manda Merchant Route, and the Rena Trade Route. Um, so yeah, it's very, very busy with a lot of uh, corporations, mega corporations. Um, it's also a kind of a fair comparison to look at it, uh, compare it to China. You know how like most corporate offices have offices in China because of the tax taxes being so minuscule in China? Yeah. That's basically what's going on with Bafui. Like, the annual operating taxes on Bafui range from 8,000 to 250,000 credits a year. Mm -hmm. Which is extremely low for large corporations. Um, like, uh, there are so many corporations on Bafui that the, one of the major exports on the world is just technology of all kinds. But uh, aside of, from that, uh, the Bafui, the, 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 the Boffins, they don't have a fully fledged military force. They don't even have a navy to protect their world. Instead, of they kind of compensate for that by having some of the best planetary shields of the galaxy, which prevent any hostile force from bombarding their world if they wanted to. Mm hmm. So yeah, you gotta, for being the best spies in the galaxy, you gotta have your asses covered 24-7 in more ways than one. Yep. And aside from Bafui, the, uh, the Boffins also have other colony worlds within their home system. Um, and uh, the Boffins, let's go ahead and talk about the Boffins themselves. The Boffins range an average height from 4 feet to 11 inches to 5 feet and 2 inches. So they are short boys. Um, they could live up to 85 years at max and are considered adults at the age of 17. Well, let me see. They okay. are, yeah. So not quite as ridiculous as the Chiss. If you recall, they are considered adults by the age of 10, but they do grow slightly quicker than your average human. But yeah, um, the, the boffins, they also possessed a fur that is colored either brown or cream. And the special thing about their fur is that it shifts in response to their emotional state by way of gentle ripples. So essentially... Yeah, that ex sorry, go on. That's explained many times in... Uh, Heir to the Empire and the Thrawn trilogy period. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's just an interesting thing about the Boffins, and one of the many interesting things that um, makes them such a great spy race is that uh, if you... Like, you'll have the only secret language to communicate between your brothers and sisters that nobody else is going to understand unless you actually know how a Boffin speaks. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um... Aside from that, they also have tappered pointed ears, and beards can be found on both males and females. Um, also, this might, sound, sound, this might sound kind of weird for a non-humanoid looking race, but uniquely, they are capable of interbreeding with other species. Well, the Twi'leks can do it, but they're near human. That's weird because the Bothans aren't near human. Yeah, and these uh, these uh, subtypes are what is called half Bothans, which I will upload very soon. Yeah, they look nothing like Bothans. They look more like satyrs. Yeah, that first that, that first dude does look like a satyr. Yeah. They do look like satyrs. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, all characteristics, which if you notice in all the boffin pictures, the boffins don't show at all. They don't have hooves, they don't have tails, and they don't have horns. No, they don't. Yeah, I just... There's think, a discrepancy there. Yeah, it is kind of weird, but I like to think that maybe it's a genetic law, uh, a lost gene that just evolved in a race that uh is of a neuro race uh i'm no scientist but that's what i assume anyway mm -hmm. well anyway um the boffins have three languages their spoken one is called boffies which became a language that influenced an early form of galactic basic um some boffies words are escarot which is even tempered bisk Regal and cough of philosophical. Their second language is Bafua, which is their written language, and their third language is Randui, which is their body language, which is spoken through their shifting fur. So I do like how diverse they are with their languages, not through uh, just speaking and through writing, but also through their body language. Almost like a sign language, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Which I think is really cool, especially for a, a uh, race that is known for subterfuge and all that. Um, the culture of the Boffins is guided by a philosophy and set of principles in ancient texts called The Way. And I'm not talking about the, uh, the Knuckles via Kedna meme. <laughs> um, the way is written by this ancient boffin hero named Gloom uh, Therisavra Dra, uh, who was known as the first leader of the Stone Clans. Um, essentially, the text outlined that each individual boffin should put their own interests above those of their comrades, their families above those of other families, their clan above the other clans, and the boffin race as a whole above other races. So essentially, the way Jez gives the boffins excuses for uh, racism and supremacy over other races. Um, the pursuit of power and influence was paramount, essentially encouraging backstabbing, subtle assassinations, and political maneuvering. Which, if you really stop and think about it, does sound a lot like the Sith Code in some regards. Yes, it does. Yeah, the Boffins are in, an inherently selfish race. They would much rather fuck you over than fuck the rest of their races or their own interests is over. Mm -hmm. While many boffins saw the way as a sacred text, many outsiders saw it as an example of everything wrong with the boffins and usually conveyed the stereotype that all boffins are untrustworthy. In fact, most boffins are habitably paranoid, believing that anyone not working with them is working against them. 
makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and if I'm going to be completely honest, uh, out of universe, that sounds like the typical mindset of a spy or any other player in Team Fortress 2. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which I think is a really nice little parallel. But anyway, um, during times of great crises, um, both in society would shift to a survivalist state known as what is called the Arkara, also known in Bafuese as a genocidal war. Uh, when an Arkara is declared, all Bothans volunteered to defend their species from impending annihilation. So basically, the one time in their history where the Bothans would be united as a race against a common enemy. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Bothan families are all organized into large clans, which are the most important social unit in Bothan society, as the loyalty of family and clan are equally important as power accumulation. Clan association was donated as the last component in a Bothan name, which would be made of a following, which is a given name, a family name, and then clan name, such as, for example... Garav Deste. Uh, he's the the Boffin is obviously named obviously named Garav, and his family is of Daz, and the clan is Tay. Or Borskphalia. Borskphalia, yeah. We'll Phalia. Yeah. Um we'll talk about him in a little bit. Um Let's see, the government of the Boffins on their homeworld is what is called the Boffin Council, also known as the Combined Boffin Clans, which serves as the legislative body and is comprised of members of 608 registered clans, with other clans petitioning for membership. The council would elect one of their own to serve as first secretary, aka the council chief, or in, or, uh, if you want to use the Galactic Republic as a comparison, their own Supreme Chancellor, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but unlike the Supreme Chancellor, they only serve a term of one year. And if there is a vote that ends in a tie, that former council chief would be the one to break the tie and select the future leader of, of the Boffin Council. Let me see. The Boffin Council had control over the other organs of the Boffin government, but only the Boffin Diplomatic Corps being independent of a council and would essentially use diplomacy to further the goals of the Boffins instead of subterfuge. Um, if you do recall a little while ago in our Star Wars alternate campaign, one of the allies or ally choices that you had for teaming up instead of with the Trade Federation was the Boffins. And if you also recall, um, one of the pros was that they have a spy network. And then I also added in the cons, they also have a spy network. Was that... I'm trying to remember. <laughs> It was uh, during the Mandalorian arc where... Uh, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, initially of uh, the peace talks... Oh, I say peace talks. The trade talks was going to have Mandalore team up with a trade federation. But uh, Arjak Ordal, with his uh, contacts within the Bounty Hunters Guild, found other options. And the, uh, the Boffins were one of those options. Because they were technically a neutral party throughout the entirety of the Clone Wars. Because, uh, we'll get into it later, but the Spy Network basically works or offers its services to everybody. But that is also of a double-edged sword where they might give you information, but they'll also give information to your enemies. Of course. That's what spies do. That is what spies do. Um... Yeah, I'm mean, seeing a lot of parallels with the Chiss, who also have their own clans and houses and all that sort of stuff. Yep. <laughs> but let me see. Let me actually go ahead and talk about the Boffin Spy Network, which is arguably one of their most famous, or I suppose in-universe, in, in universe, 
uh, infamous aspects of the Boffins. Um, it is a well-organized intelligence network that was meant to collect intelligence on potential political enemies, which in the Boffins case meant everyone, like every individual, every species, and every government in the galaxy. So essentially, they are basically Big Brother is watching it, watching you at all times. Mm -hmm. I mean, typical nineteen eighty four. I mean, who knows? Maybe a boffin is watching you right now, Hannah. Well, everybody's concerned that the NSA is watching us through our com our laptop computers. So, hi. <laughs> Yeah, hi NSA, or, or otherwise known as the, Bo the uh, Boffin Spy Network. But yeah, um, basically the Boffins, you could imagine them as the NSA, the CIA, FBI, all of those three-lettered agencies rolled into one. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like a... And it is claimed to be second to none, as no other spy network in the galaxy could claim the level and expansion of a Boffin spy network. They are everywhere. Probably not in unknown in the unknown regions, that's Vachis's territory, but they are essentially everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um and of course the spy network is used to gather and sell information to the highest bidder. And it was claimed any info would be used by the spy network and would be used to gain profit by the boffins in some shape or form. Like, I could imagine a boffin senator would try to dig up dirt on a rival, political rival, and then, hey, uh, go against this vote, otherwise I'm going to put to public your entire browser history, or something along those lines. That's, that's literally what Phalia tried to do to... Uh... Um, fucking, it, it's a trap. Oh, <laughs> uh, Admiral Akbar. Admiral Akbar, thank you. Yeah. The name was escaping me. Yeah. In the, uh, the Thrawn trilogy. Yeah. Yes, you got a pretty good insight on how Boffins approach political maneuvering with a lot of blackmail and all that shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hell, Philia's one of Leia's like political enemies in the Thrawn trilogy. So Yeah, I think yeah, he actually becomes the newest head of state of the New Republic, by the way. In the was it the the, the Yuzhang Vong? Yep, yep. Arc. Cool. I still need to read the first book of Jedi Order, so Yeah, uh <laughs> I myself need to listen to Dark Rendezvous, but I haven't gone around to it yet, but I'll get there eventually. Yeah, I still need to read Vector Prime. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the spy network, um, let's see. The in terms of organization, the, the spy network is composed of clan groups that reside on local worlds or star systems and have relative autonomy. Though given their society, which uh emphasizes, you know, prestige and personal power as well as mistrust a lot of these groups don't really want to work with each other like fuck you this is my territory get out of here mm -hmm. but yeah um um most even though it is dominated by the boffins they operate non-boffin operatives because uh it, it's pretty pretty freaking obvious if a boffins just Sneaking around a facility that's just a red flag showing, hey, the spy network is after us. But yeah, like most of the time, if they have like human operatives, they may have Duros operatives, they may have droids. They usually keep the boffins in like leadership positions because they don't want to, you know, wave a red flag in somebody's face that the, the boffin spy network are going through their browser history mm -hmm. but yeah let me see um unfortunately most of these agents wouldn't be loyal to the boffins because most of the time they forcibly make them um 
they forcibly ensure their cooperation via blackmail. So even their own operatives are being blackmailed to work for them. Mm -hmm. um, the spy network had bases on many worlds. Uh, and most of these operations would be called op fronts, which take the form of legitimate establishments like cantinas, factories, or warehouses. Like, if you ever watch any of the Jason Bourne movies or, I guess, any secret agent movie, that's basically the Boffin spy network in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, like, uh, um, they do all kinds of espionage, uh, assassinations, you know, the whole shebang. And every once in a while, they would ally with other organizations like, for example, the Huts, and sometimes even the Empire to uh, maintain their goals. You know, they gotta deal with the shady characters every once in a while. But yeah, um, it's even said on Bafui, assassin assassinations, espionage, and sabotage are considered common, almost in the same vein as debates and typical legislation on other worlds. So basically, uh, <laughs> if you're a citizen on Bafui, you better watch out, watch your back at all times. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, even though it's <laughs> it's very lucrative for businesses. I don't think I would want to be a normal citizen living there if I'm going to be watched after 24-7. Well, let me see. The, the Boffins have been considered a member of the Republic for a majority of its history. And, have and uh, you know, they practice a huge amount of influence within the Senate. Mostly, most likely through uh, blackmail and all that. But... Uh, during the Great Galactic War, the Empire would attempt to invade Bafui a total of two times, I believe. Um, the first battle would actually result in the very first victory for the Republic. And it was the beginning of the Republic. It was a very massive morale win for the Republic because they were essentially losing battle after battle against the Sith Empire at that point. Mm -hmm. But the, the legendary commander of the Republic forces on Bafui would be this Jedi master named Bailiff Elias, and he would be legendary for his heroic last stand against Imperial forces, as you see in this uh, image over here. Okay. But yeah, um... Bafui would become a heavily defended world for the remainder of the war, but unfortunately, after the, the sacking of Coruscant and after the Force signed Treaty of Coruscant, Bafui would actually be given up to the side of the Sith, because it was within the Sith's, Sith's side of the galaxy. Um... But yeah, uh, aside from that, Bafui would still be a prominent member of the Republic. Wasn't okay. Wasn't there like a an eternal fortress that was suspended over Bafui in the uh, in the uh, Eternal Empire expansion? There was supposed to be a planet. Uh, I think after a certain update, there was supposed to be Bafui, but um, it was only. It was, like, in the data, but it was never brought to full bear. Okay. Because I do recall there are some boffins that you could actually uh, talk to in Swator, but I don't remember where specifically. One of your uh, alliance, not commanders, but one of your alliance, like, personnel is uh, a boffin. Yeah. His name is Admiral Baywan Ego. Yeah, I suspected that the Boffins would be a uh, very important ally for the player character during that uh, certain storyline. Well, Bay One Ego is just a... Uh, he's the he's basically your military commander. Yeah. Well, let me see. It's 
So uh, I believe like during the new Civ Wars, it would uh, Bafui would be invaded by the uh, the forces of a Brotherhood of Darkness. But it would it's kind of vague on that part of Star Wars history. But later during the Clone Wars, Bafui would remain neutral only offering their spy network to both sides of a war, on the grounds that offering intelligence to both sides would basically hasten the war effort. So they don't they didn't lean to one particular side. They just wanted to get the war over with. And it's also kind of funny because despite being the best spy network in the entire galaxy, they never once suspected that the Supreme Chancellor was orchestrating the entire war. But no, I uh, just think that was uh, kind of an interesting detail. I guess Palpatine is just that clever. Not even the Boffins detected him. That is pretty surprising. <laughs> but yeah, um, this, however, hasn't stopped the Confederacy from courting the Boffins into working for them exclusively, even leading to General Grievous himself attempting to invade the world of Bafui and failing. It's one of the earlier episodes of The Clone Wars where uh, where Anakin loses R2, if you haven't watched that arc. Nope. Okay. Um, not too important, and Bafui does make an, an appearance. Unfortunately, the Bafins never make an appearance, which is very unfortunate. But yeah, um, with the rise of the Empire, the Bafins would remain... would. Continue to remain neutral. Um, basically, it was one of a few worlds that wouldn't be suppressed heavily by the Empire, so long as they provide intelligence and all that fine stuff. Um, during the in the early days of a galactic civil war, however, um, there would be an Imperial figurehead that would basically watch over the world, along with a garrison of stormtroopers, to kind of remind them of who is in charge of the galaxy and what would happen if they allied with a rebel alliance and all that. And the Boffins, even though they were kind of held at gunpoint by the Empire, they still continued on uh, relatively independently from the Empire. But eventually, a couple of Boffin spies would come across a schematic for a planet-killing super weapon, which we all know is the Death Star. And they yep. would get the schematics of the Death Star, hand it to a uh, rogue Imperial Moth, and long story short, Palpatine wasn't too happy about that. And when Palpatine heard about that, he went to Bafui personally. And just himself, along with two of his royal guards decided to massacre an entire city of Boffins. Yeah, uh, there's like this entire mission from Galaxy at War where you basically command Palpatine. And if you've never watched the live stream of when me and Emboss played Empire at War... Palpatine and any other Force users, whenever they attack a, a uh, building, the building just literally shakes from their intense powers in the Force. It's terrifying. But yeah, Palpatine just went to town on an entire uh, city of Boffins. And after enough genociding, one of the Boffins told him that... Uh, that the schematics for the Death Star was handed off to someone who was heading straight to Tatooine. And that led to the events of the New Hope and all that. But yeah, uh, after that nice little visit from good old Palpa Palpatine, uh, the Boffins would secretly send many of their operatives to work for the Rebel Alliance, train training them in the ways of slicing and helping them decrypt their communications network and all that. Um, and within another couple of years, um, Bof the Boffins would find plans for a second Death Star. Um, 
And as the, as the dialogue goes from Mon Mothma, many boffins would give up their lives to ensure that the schematics for the Death Star were made back to Rebel Command. Um, however, Palpatine was counting on the Rebel Alliance in gaining the new Death Star plans. Um, once again, showing that Palpatine, probably one of the only individuals in the galaxy to outsmart the entirety of the Boffin spy network. But yeah, then we know the rest, uh, Rebel Alliance blew up the Death Star, um, and the Rebel Alliance would slowly become the New Republic, and as their new allies, the Boffins would gain more power, and became much more involved in the development of military technology, as well as the inner leadership structure of the, the New Republic. Um, such as we saw with, uh, how did you pronounce his name again? Borskphalia. Torskphalia, okay. Borskphalia. Borskphalia, okay. Literally, look it up. Yeah, Borsk, like Borsh, like the, the, the Russian soup. Yep. But yeah, um, Mr. Phalia, he would be one of the, uh, many influential boffins that gained a position of power within the, the, the New Republic. Um, and uh, given that the Boffins got quite a scare from Palpatine just going up to their doorstep, they increased their military technology and got their own fleet for once. And one of their own ships was the Boffin uh, Assault Cruiser, which I think is a very cool looking ship. The normal looking ship to me. Yeah, fair enough. Um... However, the Boffins, even though they got pretty good political position within the New Republic, um, there would be several anti-Boffin riots that would happen during the later stage, uh, stages of the Galactic Civil War through an event called the Kamaz Document Crisis, which was basically the, the remnants of the Empire leaking a document that basically outlined the Boffin's uh, involvement in assisting the Empire in destroying the peaceful world of Kamaz. Um, the, That's uh, what I was talking about yeah, earlier. Yeah, the Kamaz Document Crisis. Uh, it pretty much just painted the Boffins as basically the enemy. And if uh, they didn't solve this crisis, it would have been another civil war within the New Republic when they were just getting off of the ground and uh, gaining control of the galaxy. But no, uh, Fraun had to put a uh, little spike tread for everybody there. Yes, Thrawn. Yeah, Thrawn. <laughs> But anyway, we're I'm not going to spoil that for anybody. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. But anyway, um, after a long story short, after the Boffins' names were cleared, um, they had to deal with a new crisis, which we all know is in the form of our good old buddies, the Yuzhang Vong. Um, and they were responsible for killing Mr. Freyla, uh, who was the head of state. He actually does die during the invasion of Coruscant. And due to that, um, the Boffins would initiate their newest Arkarai, which is the, uh, the genocidal war against specifically the Yuzhang Vong. Um, however, even after the end of the Yuzhang Vong war, the Boffins had no concept of a, of a ceasefire, and they would continue their genocidal war against the Yuzhang Vong when pretty much everybody else wanted peace with them. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, that's pretty much the history of the Boffins. Uh, they do have a minor history where they are controlled by, uh, Darth Krayt's Sith Empire, but that's basically background lore, but, uh, yeah, that's basically the Boffins. And let me go ahead and talk about a couple of notable characters. Um, the one that you mentioned prominently throughout this episode, is Barazk Freyla, who is the, uh, the motherfucking sleazebag of the entire uh, 
EU uh, original trilogy dude. Mm. I'm not sure if you saw this picture of him, but he looks like a uh, an absolute sleaze bag in this picture right here. He is a sleaze bag. <laughs> but he also steps up for when Thrawn is attacking in uh, was it Last Command? I think it was Last Command. Yeah. Well, let me see. Um, there are also a couple of Boffin Jedi. Um, the most notable one is Kai Hudora, who is one of who is actually one of a few survivors of Order sixty six. Okay. Um, well, let me see. There's also uh, Azara Silar, who is a Boffin pilot of Rogue Squadron. I think she looks pretty cool. Yeah, her design's cool. Yeah, and another... I can see the horse aspect here. Yeah, you could see the horse aspect more prominently with her. But another prominent Boffin Jedi would be Master... Kanali Venari, who is who has the nickname of the Fire Eater. That's a weird design for a boffin, but okay. Yeah, it is uh, a little bit weird. And uh, the next one, and apologies for the rough sketch. That's the only image I could find of her. Um, Nick Bellatua. Um, uh, she is, I believe is a uh. New Republic Admiral, and one of the few people that actually defeated the simulation of Thrawn. Well, the face looks cute. Yeah, she does look kind of cute, doesn't she? Mm-hmm. And let me see, I think this was the, the guy you were talking about from Swator. Uh, give me a minute. Um, yeah, it says here he's a uh, fleet admiral. Yes, that's Baywan Ego. Baywan Ego. He actually... Mm, is it just me or does he kind of look a little bit bald? Well, the Bothan design isn't fucking great. <laughs> yeah, especially At least in the Switcher. game. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Let me see anybody else that I could throw real quick. I think that is pretty much all the notable boffins to speak of. But yeah, I think the boffins are a really interesting... Um, they're not quite evil. More chaotic neutral than anything else. Yeah. But I legitimately think that uh, if the Chiss had another race that were their intellectual equals, I think it would be the boffins. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, if if only they didn't stop mistrusting other races, they would actually be pretty good um, people or genuine people. Because, as I mentioned in the quote at the beginning of the episode, because of their mere selfish behavior and the fact that they distrust one another, they are naturally an unhappy race. Mm -hmm. But I say that, and... Apparently, some boffins get it down with other non-boffin races. Yep. <laughs> That's going to be a furry's dream, I swear. I'm recovery next time. That's <laughs> it. But yeah, um, that is our episode on the boffins. Or in this case, uh, hi... Hi, Boffin Spy Network. Please don't upload my browser history. That would be much appreciated. But yeah, you got any uh, lingering questions, Hannah, on the Boffins or anything like that? Nope. All right. But yeah, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. It was uh, it was one heck of a rabbit hole to jump into, but I legitimately enjoy the Boffins. And uh, Disney, when are you going to make a canonized version of the Boffins? I'm waiting. Please, please They'd probably ruin them. it, honestly. I mean, not wrong. They <laughs> they need uh, well. 
Okay, the New Republic isn't exactly the greatest uh, organization in canon, so I don't think they could ruin anything with the Boffins, but that's beside the point. Um, but yeah, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Uh, looking forward to what you guys vote for for the future Patreon episode. And before I say any more, Hannah, do you want to close us out? Are you going to tell me what we're going to cover next time, or...? Um, that will be for the Patreon vote this time. Okay, so it's a vote. Yeah. All right, that's it. All right. Uh, as the Boffins would say, this is the way. This is the way. And may the Force be with you. Bye-bye.